Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. You know, it's been a few weeks since we've been in Romans. So just to kind of get a little perspective here, again, Paul begins the book, obviously at the beginning, by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and what that is. But then he right away gets into describing the lost condition of mankind. Making it clear that everyone's a sinner. It doesn't matter whether you're an outright pagan. Doesn't matter whether you're moral. Doesn't matter whether you're quote unquote religious. We have nothing in ourselves that commends us to God. But then he goes on to say, and as we've begun to see in, verse, in chapters 4 and coming on into chapter 5, that, we're, that being justified or declared righteous before God is accomplished by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But in the passage we're looking at today, believe it or not, he's saying that there's even more. More than simply having our sin washed away. More than, as he'll get into, even being delivered from the righteous wrath of God. There's more to it than that. And so that's what we'll look at. That's what we'll get into as we study here uh, beginning with verses 6 to 8, we see he points out particularly that Christ died for sinners. And as I said, he's developing this. He's laying this foundation and going on into explaining what's greater. Um, and in verse 6, we read that for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In this passage, Paul is doing, he's presenting this argument, if you will, and the type of argument he's presenting is one from what's referred to as an argument from lesser to greater. He says, well, if this is true, then obviously this has to be true as well, and this is so much more. So throughout these few verses here, that's what he will be doing. He starts by saying, look at what God did for us. While we were still sinners, we were totally without any strength and without anything, you know, we're unable to do anything for ourselves spiritually. We couldn't save ourselves, to be blunt about it, by any amount of works, by any amount of things that we did, rituals we go through. Ephesians 2.1 tells us, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive. The point here is that he saved us when there was nothing attractive about us compared to his nature. Think about this. When we compare ourselves to the holiness and righteousness of God, it's amazing to me that sometimes we can get the mindset that, God, you really got something good when you got me. It's like, dude, are you attached to reality at all? Because there's nothing in and of ourselves, as I said, to commend us to God. But just at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. As it says here, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
In Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, we read, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. This verse tells us that when chronological time was just right, God sent his son. When the right time had come, things had developed um, spiritually, economically, linguistically, politically, philosophically, geographically, God sent forth his son. It was the right time. He waited until the times were just right for the purpose that he desired to accomplish. But here we see in verse 6 that he's not just speaking of chronological time, but qualitative time. You know, there's a difference in these two Greek words, and if I told you what words we get from them, you'll understand. Um, when we're speaking of that verse from Galatians, the word there is chronos, where we get the idea of chronological time. But in our verse here in verse 6 today, and that is important, it's part of the picture there, but in the verse we're looking at today, it's kairos, which means just the right time. It's more qualitative. It's, state, it's saying, you know, it's the perfect time. Things were brought into perspective, and this is what God's doing. So when God brought everything together, he sent forth his son. And the cool thing about this is that we realize that in our own lives, those of us who know the Lord, those of us who have come into a relationship with the Lord, remember how we got saved. Remember when we got saved. You remember all those circumstances just coming together? I know for myself, you know, I had two people that I was close to die. And I got in that, you know, that situation where I was, I was wondering, you know, there's got to be more to life than this as I was at my grandmother's funeral. And just having different circumstances, different people come up to me and share at different times and just all these circumstances coming together. And I'm sure... Many of you could testify of a similar situation. It's just, but, and he allows these conditions of our lives to come to the place where we see the need of a real relationship with him. But the question for us is, have you, have you realized your total inability to work things out on your own? Has he brought you to the place that you're really ready to surrender to his love? In verse 7 we read, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. Now it's really, his point there is it's really rare for someone to die for someone else, to be willing to die for someone else. Um, even if they're a good person. I was reading about Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy. He was the one who, uh, when, during the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan, you can see him if you watch the video. He, got, he, he sees where the shooter's coming from and he goes like this. You know, he just jumps right out in front of the, the man and he takes a bullet to protect the president. But that's part of their training, we could say, as a Secret Service agent. They're trained to jump in front of a bullet. For, you might think as well, oh, it's for the president. There's a good reason for that.
But self-preservation is really one of our strongest drives. It's, we don't think that way. We don't think of laying down our lives. But notice here that Paul says that it's rare for a person to die for a righteous man. But someone might be willing to die for a person who's determined to be good or benevolent in their actions. This is a standard that the world seems to set and applies to such things. Who is the most deserving? Who's willing to be saved? Well, I don't know about you. When you were in school, I was, you know, back in the 70s and in high school. And remember those situation ethics exercises? I get, you get in these conversations in your classes about, okay, you're all in a boat and you only have so many supplies, who are you going to throw out of the boat? <laughs> you know, so who is really worthy to stay in the boat and survive? And they always, and they, I, I always thought it was funny, they always had a clergyman in there, in there and you, you know, because they figure he's the first one to go, what do we need this guy for? You know, and, and so and they'll have a doctor and these other people in there. You know, who would you choose? But Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 reads, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16, we read, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, the important thing about this is to realize that we shouldn't assume or presume of, that we know what God thinks, but we need to seek him for what he thinks in a matter. In verse 8 we read, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates the uniqueness of his own agape love. It is a love that's only defined by him. And of course, in 1 Corinthians 13, we get the definition. But it's interesting to me to notice that, yeah, obviously agape is a Greek word, and it means that total self-giving love without really consideration of yourself. It's just, you know, giving for the sake of giving. And when you think about it, the Greeks came up with this word, but they didn't know what to do with it, really. It's like we have this, you know, philosophical type of love out here, but they never pretended to attain to it because, you know, you study Greeks a little bit, they were pretty pagan, you know, in their perverse in their worship. And so, but what has taken place with that word is, it, is that the meaning of it has really been filled in the New Testament in the description of what God did through Christ. His love stands out in the fact that it was towards sinners. See, yeah, we can think of, oh, all these wonderful people we can show our love towards. He did the opposite. His love was for the down and outers. His love was for those who were totally lost. But 
you know what? I think, well, that excludes me. No, it is. No, it doesn't. Because from God's perspective, we're all down and out. We're all sinners lost with that and without hope apart from him, who have no possibility of straightening things out on our own. The wild thing is that we as believers are called to love one another with the same type of love. As it says in 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. That is so amazing to me. You know, when you see this in Scripture, when God calls us to do something that's totally impossible for us to do, love. He uses the same word when he tells husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, making these statements about love, this love that really is this God type of love that we're totally incapable of. So how can we respond when we're commanded to do this? Because, you know, even though he's, he has told us, he commanded us to do this, he didn't command us to do it in our own strength. What we can do is allow him to love others through us. Because the way we're to live our Christian lives as a whole isn't in our own strength in the first place. There's two verses that are applied to so many situations in the Christian life. One of them is obviously Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And also Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So his love is worked out in our lives. And you know, there are people, and we all know people, we have people in our lives that we have a real difficult time showing love toward. There's some pretty gnarly people out there. And sometimes there's people, no matter how nice you try to be to them, it's like, you know, it's like they're stabbing you in the back. They're doing you wrong. They're doing... And, and sometimes that's in your family, and sometimes that's even in the church. I think, Lord, how can I love this person? And the answer is, you can't. And so what he would say is, let me do it through you. Stop trying to do it yourself. Allow me to work in your life and in this situation. And so that in it and through it, he gets the glory. That's what he desires to do. His love is demonstrated in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The first step is to realize our condition. We are sinners. Many miss out on the grace of God and experiencing the grace of God in their lives because they don't realize their true condition or they don't want to accept it. We want to come up with something, you know, we've listened to too many psychologists, and we want to come up with something, you know, we want to have a positive self-image. Well, the point to me isn't having a positive self-image or a negative self-image. It's having a biblical self-image. It's not that, oh, just think positive about yourself and, you know, 
keep reading to yourself lots of positive affirmations and you are wonderful. You know, all of that kind of nonsense. But realize, you know, and here's where it comes down to getting a biblical understanding of who we are. It's the realization that, yes, we are sinners, totally lost apart from God. In fact, as we'll see, apart from him, we're headed for his righteous wrath. That's going to be poured out on a lost, Christ-rejecting world. But the cool thing about it is to realize where our value comes from, where our quote-unquote self-image should really come from, and that's a bad word anyway, but you get what I mean, is for him is, is the fact that our value comes from the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's not because I'm trying to think of some type of value for myself, but it's that he valued me. That he valued me. Because the problem is, for mankind, if you don't realize your real condition, your true condition, you don't see the need for a savior. That's why at times, you know, when we share with people or when we witness people, sometimes it's necessary to get them lost before, so we can get them saved. Have them, you know, see a realistic picture of themselves. Now, in verse 9, continuing on here, we do see what I mentioned briefly, and that's his death saves us from God's wrath. As it says in the beginning of the verse, much more than having been justified by his blood. Paul continues to support his position by using these words of comparison. You'll see these words, these expressions a couple of times in here, he'll say much more than or much more or not only that, you know, he's building and building upon this case here. And the point being that God did all of that for us while we were still sinners. How much more will he do for us now that we're his children? As Romans 8, 31 and 32 says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Has God worked in your life by saving you by his grace? You know, we get these mistaken ideas. We, at times, we think, oh, you know, yeah, we get, understand from the scripture, from Ephesians chapter 2, that we've been saved by grace, and not, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But we get the mistaken idea that, well, now, to live the Christian life, we have to do it by works. It's all of these things we have to, quote, unquote, do for God. That's just wrong. Because what he's saying there, here, is that if it was by grace that you are saved, and he saved you while we were yet sinners, totally without any ability to save ourselves... You know, how much more does he want to do in your life now that he's your children? You're, we're his children. How much more will that grace be demonstrated? 
in the life of the believer. The basis for the continued demonstration of his grace in your life is that you have been justified, declared righteous by his blood. And you know, this is a critical point really for our Christian life and walk is to believe that God desires to work in and through your life solely on the basis of his grace. It's not because you had a good day today or you were extra spiritual today that he'll work in your heart, in your life, that he'll use you, that he'll work in your life. I just know it's to realize that it's solely by his grace. It's a, not a matter of getting yourself cleaned up, but trusting him to work in your life. And continuing in verse 9, he said, we shall be saved from wrath through him, referring to Jesus. Because we've been justified by his blood, we shall ultimately be saved. Now, salvation is a standing, it's a process, and it's an end result. You have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. That's what the theological terms are. We've been justified, declared righteous. We're being sanctified by his working in our lives, and ultimately, in his presence, we'll be glorified. It's it's always important to realize that just realize just what we are being saved from in order that we can properly understand what it means to be saved. You know, we're saved, as the scripture tells us, as it tells us right here, what we're being saved from is the righteous wrath of God. But and kind of like this modern churchianity sort of stuff we're hearing these days is, you know, come to Jesus and he'll, he'll fix your family. Come to Jesus and you'll have a happy life. Come to Jesus and you'll get this benefit or that benefit. But what the scripture says is you're going to hell. Come to Jesus, that he might save you, that you might not experience the righteous wrath of God. Do your sin and my sin. All of those other things, yeah, for the most part, they'll change when you come into a relationship with Jesus because you'll change. But you can have your family totally together still experience the judgment of God. We're saved from the judgment of God that we truly deserve. But because you've experienced the grace of God through Christ, you'll not experience that judgment. That judgment's been poured out on him. And as a result, we can have a confident assurance for the future. As he says here, you, we shall be saved from wrath through him. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust, well, I can't remember all those words. In Jesus' name. Um, well, you don't want me to sing anyway, so I'll leave it at that. 1 John 5, 13 tells us, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the reason for the writing, that you know. 
And then in verse 10, we see that, and this is, you know, he's been building it up to this point here. And in verse 10, he goes further and it says his life assures us of his grace. In the beginning of verse 10, it says, for if we were, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. If God showed so much love for us while we were his enemies, how much more will he demonstrate his love towards us now that we're his children? The world is under the mistaken notion that all people are children of God. While everyone's a unique creation of God made in his image, not everyone has a relationship with God of being his child. In fact, to a group of Jewish people, Jesus said in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it from his own resources for he, excuse me, is a liar and the father of it. So what he's saying there is that people are demonstrating by their lives who their father is. Now, what is an enemy? An enemy is one who, that is antagonistic towards another person. And as it says here, that when we were enemies, when we were antagonistic against God, when we were at odds with God because of our sin, we were then reconciled to him through the death of his son. God reconciles us to himself. To be reconciled means to change from a hostile relationship to one of peace. God initiates the movement here from antagonism to reconciliation in the work of Christ on the cross. And what we simply do is respond to God by yielding and trusting. It's so totally amazing to me to think of why, to think, God, why would you even do this? And we make a mistake so often when we try to figure it out because the answer is all in God and not in us. In his nature, in his character, in his love. And then, here's where we get to what he's really developing here as he uses those expressions like much more and you know more than this and verse uh, continuing in verse 10 it says much more much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life Paul uses this expression much more in describing the incredible working of his grace towards us in Christ. The work of Christ upon the cross did much more than just restore what Adam lost. Now think about this. Have you, you know, sometimes we thought, we think that, okay, Jesus came to fix everything. You know, Adam blew it. Jesus came, fixed it. So we just kind of get it back the way it was. No. He's doing do you ever think about it that God actually knew exactly what Adam was going to do before he created him, before he created the world, before he created anything? He knew exactly what would happen. But the ultimate result has worked out through his plan is ultimately going to be so much better. so much better in our relationship with the Lord. You know, 
Think about it. Adam, what did he do? We have the description in Genesis. He said he walked with, you know, that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day in the garden. Well, what are we going to have? I'm not going to walk around a bunch of plants. I'm going to walk with God in glory. In his eternal kingdom. You see, it's much more than that. And what we share is so much more of a close and personal relationship with him. And this is what Paul's getting to as he says, you know, you know, he talks about us being saved. But he says, there's more than this. He talks about us being delivered from the wrath of God. But there's more than this. And we think, what could possibly be more than that? You know, we don't just come to know the Lord academically or religiously, but what he's saying here is that God actually desires to share his life with us. That it's not just doing a patchwork on your life so you're acceptable. It's that he's imparting that he gives us life. His life. We give him our sin, he gives us his life. Imagine that. Think of everything that we had as a result of our sin. Condemnation. Judgment. You know, just all the negative effects of our lives. Being dead in our trespasses and sin. But as it says, while we were yet sinners, he died for us, not just to do that patchwork, not to say, okay, you're acceptable now, you get in by the skin of your teeth, but to actually impart his life to us that, as he said in um, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes, doesn't come but to steal, kill, and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And that abundant life, you know, even the description of eternal life, especially in the Gospel of John, isn't just talking about, again, time, chronology, and the, but it's speaking about a quality of life. It's talking about an age-abiding life. He's sharing his life with us, that eternal life that goes on forever. But that life that we can begin to experience in a relationship with him here and now. That life of a close intimacy with him. And as I said, he's just not doing patchwork. He's just not wanting to make religious people. He wants to have a relationship, a close, intimate relationship with each and every one of us. That's what he went to the cross for. As it says in Hebrews chapter 12, around verse 2, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And you think, what was that joy set before him? It's you and me and his presence for eternity having that close, intimate fellowship with us, having that relationship with us, so much more. And then in verse 11, he sums up what he said here and gives a further result in the you know, general perspective. Again, he's brought it beyond, you know, just thinking you're going forward to get the fire insurance and that sort of thing. It's about relationship. And then in verse 11, he says really that the point being that we 
rejoice in God through Jesus Christ, as it says, and not only that. Man, it's, it's like he keeps piling it on here. It's like, okay, you're saved. You've exp- you're delivered from the wrath of God. That's good, but there's more. Then he says, the point is, having a close, intimate relationship with God through Jesus, that we can actually have personal fellowship with God. But then he gets to verse 11 and he says, and not only that, how much more could there be? And he says, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul continues to pile on in his description of the blessings of the grace of God here. And, you know, as if these other things weren't enough. But then he says, you know, rejoicing in the work of God in Christ. You know, it's a vital part of the life of the believer. It's to be a vital part. Jesus, when... uh, He rose from the dead in Matthew chapter 28. You know, the ladies go to the tomb and and they see the angel descend. They see the angel toss the stone over his head and set on it. and, And he tells them, hey, go tell this disciple he's he's risen. But then as they're leaving, they see Jesus. And the first thing he says to them, rejoice, rejoice, have joy. He's like what the Bible describes as joy unspeakable and full of glory. He doesn't want us to see our relationship with him as a burden. Oh, I got to do this. Imagine if you treated your wife or husband that way. Ask your wife. Honey, what are we having for dinner? Oh, it's the wrong question, husband. But you ask that, and it's like, what are you asking me that for? Go fix it yourself. You know, so, you know, what? The idea of a drudgery there. I'll do it if I have to but don't expect it every day. You know, and the other way around, you know, you heard the expression, the, the, the wife comes to her husband and says, honey, you never tell me you love me anymore. And he responds and says, I told you that when I married. Yeah, if it changes, I'll let you know. But it's not that, you know, it's, he desires for us to experience with him in that relationship that joy unspeakable and full of glory. As Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice. And that's where the real heart of worship comes from. And the way we feel about worship can say a lot about where our heart's at in reference to our relationship with the Lord. Worship here, as we come to worship in the morning, isn't just warm-up for the message. It's not a time filler. It's not entertainment. It's an opportunity. It's an, op- it's an opportunity to express to the Lord that joy that you have in a relationship with him. And if you're struggling with worship, 
if you're struggling. And again, worship shouldn't be just what you do here. Do you take opportunity to worship? But if you're struggling with it, we need to ask ourselves the question, what, is there a problem with your, with your relationship with the Lord? And what exactly and how your relationship is, how you are relating to him. Because that worship should overflow. It flows freely from a heart that realizes what God has done on their behalf. Do you rejoice in the Lord in such a way that it causes you to spontaneously break out in worship? when you see the work of God in your life. And then Paul continues that through whom we have, uh, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. He isn't just talking about some common reconciliation. Oh, we get a couple of people together. They were at odds with each other, so we kind of reconciled them. But he's talking about the ultimate reconciliation. Dealing with individual conflicts is often like dealing with a lot of small brush fires. You can put out one brush fire and another one seems to pop up. But putting out a brush fire has no real effect until you put out the blaze that's sparking the smaller fires in the first place. So many of the problems in our lives come from not being rightly related to the Lord. Not walking in obedience to him, not walking out that relationship with him. If you are strung out from dealing with all the conflicts in your life, you need to take it to the Lord and see if there's anything that you've not yielded to him. Is there's anything that you're holding back from him? Proverbs 16, 7 reads, When a man's ways please the Lord... He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And is there an issue that you need to reconcile with God? Something, again, that you're holding back, that thing that's like, God, I got this thing. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm not going to surrender it. That thing's going to cause you so many other problems. So, God has so much more for you in Christ than you can even imagine. You have a loving Savior that died for you. You will not be experiencing the righteous wrath of God due your sin. He actually gives you his life in order for you to experience Experience eternal life in his name. And in all this, because of all this, we have a reason to rejoice. We have a reason to rejoice. And just realizing how much God loves you and realizing how much God has done for you is going to continue to do for you. Where you are, isn't it? In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, first letter to the Corinthians, he makes a statement. He says, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those for 
has prepared, prepared for him who loves him. But then he says, but God has revealed it through his spirit. God has revealed it through his spirit. That's what he desires to do. Because if we're going to be honest about ourselves and our lives and how we live our lives, we don't have a clue. But God has prepared so much for us. And that he desires to reveal in and through us as we walk out our relationship with him. God's faithful. So no matter what you're facing, in the midst of it, God desires to demonstrate his love. God desires to bless your life in the midst of the problems that you experience. God desires to show it all to you. And demonstrating his love day by day by day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your incredible love to us. Lord, it is so much more than we can even fathom, Lord. That while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, you died for us, the ungodly. Lord, I just want to pray that if there's anyone here who hasn't come into that relationship with you, hasn't yet been reconciled, to you through the blood of Christ. Lord, you'd be working on their hearts. Even now, Lord, that realizing that all they need to do is come to you, confess their sin, repent of their sin, meaning to agree with you about their sin and turn towards you, Lord, and receive the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only reason for that we can be saved. Lord, we thank you for that, Father. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, Tammy's going to lead us in one more worship song. And as she does that, can I just invite you to search your heart? Well, even better, allow the Lord to search your heart. And think about, is there an area of your life that you need reconciliation? Not with another person, because that's not really the topic.